Good afternoon. My name is Tim Smothers. I'm the pastor here at the Battle Creek Seventh-day Baptist Church. Like so many other churches here, not just in the state of Michigan where we are, but around the country and around the world, uh, we have had to suspend our services due to the uh, coronavirus that is going around. And so we decided that we would go ahead and put the messages on Facebook uh, for the foreseeable future so that we can worship together and, and study God's word together. Let's go ahead and let's pray, shall we? Loving Father God, we thank you that uh, you are God. Father, we thank you that we can come before you. Father, we recognize that we pray to a holy God, a God who is way different uh, than we are, a God who is worthy of our worship and praise. Father, we're, we're thankful that we can study your word together here uh, this afternoon. Lord, as we, as we begin, I pray that you would be glorified by the proclamation of your word uh, as, we, as we talk once again about the formula of prayer that you have given, uh, not just to uh, the disciples, uh, Lord, but to us as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. We are going to be in the book of Matthew chapter 6. We have been going through uh, just a great series on the disciples' prayer. Uh, I call it that because the disciples, they come to Jesus with a question, uh, just like you and I do so very often. And their question revolved around what it is uh, to pray. Uh, they had no idea what the concept was uh, to pray to God. And so they go to Jesus and they say, uh, how do we do this? Uh, teach us to pray. And so Jesus gives them uh, really the formula for prayer. Jesus never told them. And Jesus doesn't tell us uh, to recite the Lord's Prayer all the time in this format. As a matter of fact, as Jesus says earlier in the chapter, avoid vain repetitions, okay? Uh, what he is saying here is take this formula and let it transform your prayer life as you go uh, before the throne of grace. So Jesus starts out by, by instructing the disciples that you can go to God and you can call him Father. You are his children. If you have put your faith and your trust in him, uh, you are part of a new family, you have a new name, you have a new identity in Jesus Christ. And we can go to him and he loves us like a father does. He wants what is best for us. You know what? Uh, he shares in our joy. He shares in our sorrow. And I don't know about y'all, but you know, when I was growing up, uh, there were times where uh, I needed some discipline. My father wasn't afraid to give that to me, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, our Heavenly Father isn't, isn't going to shy away from that either. Uh, we go to him as our father. Our father is very different than you and I. You know, it's been said uh, very often, I, I hear this, that, boy, you look just like your dad. Uh, I count that as a compliment. I really do. Uh, my dad is just one of my closest friends, and I so appreciate that about him. Uh, how much more important is it for me, uh, as much as I love my dad and looking like him, uh, I think I have a little more hair than he does, uh, but how important is it? Uh, that I strive to look like my heavenly father and to and to emulate him and to become more and more like him. And the reason why is because God is a holy God and, and he is our father. He is very different uh, than you and I. And so we can go to him as our heavenly father, knowing that he is a just and a holy God. So our father who is in heaven, Hallowed be your name. We talked about the importance of the kingdom and that God's kingdom is not here on earth yet. Uh, what's the proof of that? You know what? You don't have to look any further uh, than the front page of the news or, or just turn on the news just for a few minutes, right? And we can see uh, that we live in a broken world. Uh, it is broken uh, because we as God's creation have, have broken it up. God's kingdom is not here yet, but one day, uh, one day it will be. 
And so we pray uh, for God's kingdom to come. It's a very bold prayer uh, that, that we can take before the throne. We talked about the importance of God's will being done in us and through us. L let me say this, uh, you are not going to thwart the will of God. Uh, you want to pray that God's will is done in you and through you. You don't want it to be in spite of you. Uh, be found being faithful to do what God has called you to do, uh, fulfilling his will uh, for your life and for what he has called you to do. We talked about the importance of a praying for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. And that God gives us everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to him. It is satisfying to us. That is a textbook definition of grace at work in the life of the believer. We can praise God that uh, we have food, shelter, clothing, uh, every aspect of who we are, how God has created us. Uh, uh, God is intimately involved in that. He gives us what we need and he provides for us. We can thank him for providing uh, our daily bread. We talked about the importance of forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Uh, we have been forgiven by God. We have salvation uh, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As I have been forgiven, the question becomes, am I quick to forgive those who have wronged me? Uh, I certainly have wronged a holy God and the Holy God has forgiven me. I am not holy, right? I, I am not God. I strive to be like him. But if God has forgiven me, how important is it for me to forgive those uh, who have wronged me in some way? We talked about uh, last week, uh, we talked about temptation, and that's something that uh, uh, we don't necessarily like to talk about, uh, but the reality is uh, there is nobody that falls outside the realm of being tempted. Okay, It is not God that causes us uh, to be tempted to sin. Uh, the book of James makes that very clear, for example. We are all tempted uh, in one way or another uh, throughout really every day of our lives. Here's what God does. God gives us the strength. God gives us the perseverance to fight that temptation. And we do that as we find ourselves walking in his way. The more that I am like him, the less I am like the world around me. And so being able to, uh, to pray, being able to study God's word, meditating on God's word, uh, being able to uh, fellowship with others uh, is such an important part of this. Putting on the whole armor of God, we talked about that and the importance of making sure uh, that we don't miss a part of the armor, but that we are fully prepared uh, for the battle uh, that we are engaged in. The last part of verse 13 uh, talks about uh, deliver us from evil. And oh, if there ever was a time where we need to pray to be delivered from evil and from the forces of the evil one. Uh, I think that certainly is today. You see, last week when we talked about lead us not into temptation, uh, really what that meant uh, was the fact that uh, uh, we as God's children are conscious of, of past sins and, and a failure and we are fearful of falling into further sin, okay? When we pray, deliver us from evil, uh, that recognizes that this life is a struggle uh, with an enemy that is set out to destroy us, uh, that is set out to oppose us. And so there are dangers that come uh, to us each and every day. But knowing how we can fight those dangers head on, knowing that we don't do this in our own strength, and there's nothing I can do uh, in and of myself uh, uh, for deliverance from the evil one, this all comes from the Spirit of God himself. And so we go to God uh, for our deliverance. That is why he says here, 
deliver us from evil. He, nowhere do you see Jesus saying, figure it out on your own or go out and fight the battle by yourself. Okay, we are told that we are to pray, deliver us uh, from evil. So this evil or this evil one uh, really comes uh, from uh, the belief that Satan is real, okay? Satan uh, does exist. Uh, the Lord's Prayer recognizes that evil uh, really is a daily uh, fact of life. It is something that, that, uh, uh, that happens. It is something that we find ourselves uh, struggling with so very much. Let me just say that Hollywood, uh, Hollywood can be very creative sometimes, can't they? Uh, they will picture Satan in a variety of different ways. Uh, there are some that will that will give him a pitchfork and a funny tail. Uh, there are some that will uh, that will just make him as a a total monster, if you will. Okay, uh, Scripture says that Satan comes to us in a variety of ways. Uh, Satan is known as an angel of light. Uh, Satan is a deceiver. Uh, Satan is a liar and a slanderer, and so he can come at us from a variety of different ways, and we need to know that uh, because uh, Satan has many tactics at his disposal, and knowing what those tactics are help us uh, to be able, uh, with God's help, of course, uh, to have defense from the evil one. You see, Satan is a created being. Okay. Uh, there are some religions that will say that Satan and God have the same power. Uh, nowhere in the word of God do we see that. Okay. Satan is a created being, and because of that, uh, we need to remember that uh, Satan is, is not equal to God. Okay. They, are, they are not on the same plane. Okay. Uh, Satan is not all-powerful. Satan can't be everywhere at the same time. Satan is not all-knowing, okay? We know in, from Scripture that God is all of these things. Satan is a created being, and so uh, he is not on the same footing uh, with God himself. Scripture gives us uh, descriptions of who Satan is, and it gives us a glimpse into his character. In John chapter 8, verse 44, uh, uh, John writes that, Satan is a liar. Uh, Satan is the father of lies, okay? Satan is the one who, who will put that untruth out there. And sometimes there will be just a little nugget of, of truth to what he says, but then he twists that. Satan is a liar. He is the father of lies. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, we read that uh, uh, Satan is known as the God of this age. From the time that uh, the book of 2 Corinthians was written, he has been known as the God of this age. And so here we are almost 2,000 years later, okay? Satan is still uh, the God of this age. In Matthew chapter 9, he's known as the prince of demons. He is known as the prince of that unseen realm uh, that, is a, that is a real thing. And uh, Satan is the one that is directing the traffic. He is the prince of demons. In uh, John chapter 12, uh, he is known as the prince of this world. And in Ephesians 2, uh, he is called the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So Satan is known by many, by many things. Okay, and, and as you look at these characteristics and these descriptions, you can see how Satan uh, can, can filter uh, evil all through the world all around us. There is a defense uh, that, that we have against Satan, and we, as a God's children, we must be prepared uh, to meet that attack. Okay. Uh, there are four principles that I want to share just very briefly uh, here this afternoon about meeting the attacks of the enemy, meeting the attacks of the evil one. Uh, the first one is this. There is a principle, I think, of respect. Scripture tells us that we don't need uh, to fear Satan. In 1 John chapter 4, it says this, little children, and I love how, how John puts that. 
Little children, he gives us a reminder, you are from God, you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now that should be enough to make a Baptist shout. That should make us uh, just rejoice. Because that right there tells us uh, that we have a defense. We can win this thing with the power of God and his help. You see, our confidence doesn't lie uh, in what I, uh, Tim Smothers, can do. Our ability to counteract evil is found in the character and the strength of our Heavenly Father who delivers us. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The principle of removal. Our Heavenly Father uh, endows us by his Spirit. With spiritual common sense, he expects us to avoid being in temptation. Now we know, and we talked about this uh, uh, last week, uh, there's temptation all around us. It doesn't mean that we need to fall for it. We need to expect that it's there. And we need to make sure that we do everything that we can uh, to avoid those things. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, it says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. It doesn't say stay, stick around and ponder it for a while. <laughs> Rather, flee these things. Pursue righteousness. Pursue godliness. Pursue faith. Pursue love. Pursue steadfastness. Pursue gentleness. We are supposed to flee temptation. We are supposed to pursue these other attributes. We are supposed to run from temptation and run toward the, the very mind of God himself. There's the pr principle of resistance. In James chapter 4, verse 7, it tells us, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Submit. Submit yourselves to God. And then it says this, uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Here he's using a verb tense. And really uh, what this verb tense means is, you know what, it's time for us uh, not to be wishy-washy, but rather to take a decisive stand. Submit yourselves to God. Flee. Resist the devil and he's going to take a hike. He's going to flee from you. The Apostle Peter advises Christians that they should not give in to Satan. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. There's a principle of readiness as well. Our best defense against evil is to have a right relationship with God through the practical application of his word. Scripture warns the believer that we must be prepared. Jesus warned his disciples in uh, Mark chapter 14, watch and pray. Don't be aloof. Don't be uninformed but rather watch and pray. Why? Lest you enter into temptation. Uh, the spirit is indeed willing, uh, the verse goes on to say. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that is why you need to be on your guard and you need to be watching. And so as we talked about last week, and this really goes hand in hand with fighting temptation, uh, the importance of putting on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the evil one. We need to be ready. We need to be watchful. We need, notice what it says there. It doesn't say uh, just put on half of the armor, but put on the whole armor of God. I think last week I used the example of a Roman soldier. When they went to war, they made sure that every piece was on and that it was on correctly. You never saw 
uh, a Roman soldier go to war in a baseball hat. Uh, they had a helmet, and there was a reason why they had a helmet. And so we, as, as God's children, uh, were given the armor that we need. We need to make sure that we are putting it on. Uh, the belt of truth, for example, it was the soldier's belt that held all the armor in place. It is the truth that holds uh, what we believe in place. If Satan is going to depend on deception to maintain its power, our first defense is to know the truth. We are to wear the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness, it protects the vital organs, it protects the heart, the lungs, the kidneys. It is righteousness that protects us in those vital areas of the battles that we fight. And so uh, we need to make sure that we have on the breastplate of righteousness. Without it, uh, Satan can attack. Satan will attack. And we have just made it very easy for him. The shield of faith. The Roman uh, soldier's shield was of sufficient size that the Roman soldier could take a shelter behind it, uh, could get away from the arrows and the spears of the enemy. You know what? In order to quench the fiery darts of, of Satan's temptations, uh, we must seek to know and apply God's truth. We have the shield of faith. We're also given a helmet. Uh, the helmet of salvation. It is the knowledge that we are saved uh, that provides protection from Satan and the sword of discouragement and doubt that he wields our way. You know what? If you don't have a helmet and you are going into battle, you are at such a disadvantage. What happens uh, if you get struck in the head? The whole body dies, right? Uh, it just does not take much for that to happen. We need to make sure that as, as God's children, as we are putting on that armor, we don't neglect uh, the helmet of salvation. We're also told this, uh, we're given an offensive weapon as well, the sword of the spirit, uh, which is the word of God. You know what? Uh, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is so important. It's important that we get to know uh, this sword. God's word is our only offensive weapon. It can only be used effectively if we know its promises. I don't know about you all. I'm thankful for the promises of God. I'm thankful that when we find ourselves in the midst of struggle and doubt, that God's word says, I'm not going to cut and run when the going gets tough. I am with you every step of the way. And not only that, I am giving you this armor. Put it on. Use it. It is there to protect you. Although Satan may be the ruler of this present world, though he may be the prince of the power of the air, uh, he may have evil spirits at his command. Uh, let me say this. He has no claim over the children of God nor does he have any power to tempt them except for what the Father allows. I love the confidence that we have knowing that God gives us what we need. I want to end with this verse here. It's out of uh, the book of Psalm, chapter 121, uh, verses 7 and 8. It says this, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Know this, that as we fight together, as we, as we fight this war that is going on for the hearts and souls of men, know this, that God has given you everything that you need uh, to fight this war to fight the good fight. It all starts with an intimate time of communion and relationship with your Heavenly Father. I want to encourage you uh, in the days and weeks ahead, uh, you know what? It's going to be trying times for us all. 
And so I want to encourage you to pray for one another, pray for us as a church. We are certainly praying for you. Uh, you will be hearing from me. I've been on the phone uh, uh, this morning for, uh, for several hours, actually, just talking with people. We are here to help. We are here to pray. We are here to do whatever we can to help uh, in this, in this uh, uh, time of uncertainty. Uh, don't panic. Pray. So let's go ahead and let's do that now, shall we? Father God, we thank you for your word. Father, I pray that uh, we would realize and understand the, that while Satan is real, uh, Lord, uh, you are the one, uh, Lord, who calls the shots for us. Uh, Satan is, is your creation. He is not God. We thank you that we pray to you. We thank you that we have access to the throne of grace. As Christ taught the disciples to pray, Lord, I pray that we too would learn a new and dynamic way to pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.